um, do I use TPP? Do I lay people off and let them collect? Because a lot of times the employee was better off collecting. Um, so, you know, as this progressed and um, the issue was raised to Congress, they passed what was known as the PPP Flexibility Act. And this was a significant win for small businesses and self-employed individuals. And I'm just a few key terms or a few key points from that Flexibility Act. They extended the period that you are allowed to use your funds from eight to 24 weeks. So significant change. It's gonna give people a lot more opportunity to use those funds as they were intended and to give you an opportunity to get full forgiveness. In addition, the original threshold to use those funds just for payroll was set at 75%. So you had to use 75% for payroll. The remaining 25% you were allowed to use for rent, utilities, mortgage payments for the interest portion, but you had to have 75% spent on payroll. They reduced that to 60, which gave a lot more flexibility to business owners to be able to use these funds for rent and utilities and then paying interest on their monthly payments. So that was a big win as well. For loans that are not forgiven, they extended the period that you're gonna to have to repay the funds. And I hope not too many of you have this, but in the event you don't get full forgiveness, if your loan, um, if you received your loan proceeds after June 5th, on or after June 5th, you'll be able to repay that over five years instead of two. It's still 1% interest. If you received your loan proceeds before June 5th, it's still a two year repayment, but you could, now you have the option of working with your local bank where you got your funds and they have the option of extending that past the two year mark. As we mentioned, there's some additional safe harbors that were passed. We'll discuss those more in detail. And one kind of overlooked item from the Flexibility Act was the fact that if originally, if you were to receive PPP funds, you were not allowed to take advantage of this um, deferment of your 2020 employer portion of Social Security tax. So the 6.2% that the employer is paying on all wages, um, the Congress allowed a deferment of that, meaning you would have to pay half of that 2020 employer tax in 2021 and the other half in 2022. So for businesses that were suffering from cash flow, they could not deposit the employer portion of social security tax, keep those funds for operations, and then pay them back next year. Um, you know, we would advise, you know, do some serious cash flow analysis before electing to do that, but it was an option that was now added. You can have PPP funds and also take advantage of this social security tax deferral. Um, one big point that Bill and I wanted to point out was that there are still funds available. You can still apply to this. Uh, the deadline is coming up August 8th. And another point to make the injury, uh, economic injury disaster loans. So there was an advanced portion that some of you I'm sure applied for. It, it came across as a $10,000 grant. Basically, it was $1,000 per employee up to $10,000. So for any of you that receive the EIDL advance, that is gonna reduce your PP loan forgiveness. So if you receive 50,000 in PPP loan and you got 10,000 EIDL advance, your forgiveness is gonna be limited to 40,000. You will have to repay um, 10,000 of that EIDL loan, or it's gonna turn into a loan, whether it's two or five years. Um, is Claudia, is Bill on? Bill, are you on with us? He is. Let me unmute and Bill can, should be able to talk. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes, Brandon. So I was going to see if you could take over uh, running through some of the definitions and key terms. I, I'm sorry, I got a little break up here. I, I'll start for us, Bill. So just to run through a few. Yeah, we'll, go ahead. So I'll start with the definition and key terms here. So when you see us discussing EE or ER, that's the, referring to the employee or the employer portion. Um, you'll see the term covered period come up a lot in this. Um, so the covered period is 24 weeks from the day you receive the funds, from the day it hit your bank account. Um, 
if you received your loan before June 5th, you can elect to have the eight-week period. Um, for some people, that might be beneficial. For most, the 24-week period is going to be the best way to go. But you don't have the option of eight weeks if you received your loan on or after June 5th. Another key point is this alternative covered period. So for simplicity and to help small business owners align their payroll records with their cover period, um, Congress and the SBA is now allowing you to start your 24 or eight week period at the beginning of your next payroll cycle from when you receive the funds. So there's a little example here saying that um, Simon Smokehouse received their PPP funds on Friday, May 1st, but their payroll runs Sunday to Saturday. So for simplicity, we can push that forward to Sunday and elect to start that on Sunday, May 3rd, and run it until Saturday, October 18th. So then when you're going to go to your payroll company um, or your internal records, now we can just run you know, 24 weeks of payroll to keep things simple. Um, one thing to point out, you must be either a weekly or bi-weekly payroll cycle. So if you're going um, bi-monthly or monthly payroll, you can't elect this alternative covered period, which I'm, I'm sure most of us are still on the weekly or bi-weekly. Uh, Bill, do you wanna hop in on the cash, non-cash compensation? I can, I can hear you, but I, I'm having trouble with the audio portion. Oh, we can hear you. You, you can? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, just from, from where we are here, uh, just a you know, non-cash compensation, uh, you know, the definitions have been laid out by the SBA. It has modified from, you know, time to time, uh, but it seems to be, you know, settling in with, uh, uh, with uh, the, the, the uh, definitions as, as presented. Uh, what we're seeing is that this is all going to be driven by uh, hopefully with you folks having good uh, payroll programs or payroll companies, uh, the payroll companies being able to run reports that will take us right in on uh, honing into this, uh, into this language. Uh, as you move through with business uh, mortgage interest payments and, and rent or lease payments, again, those are you know, pretty self-explanatory. But uh, making sure that uh, th that the program uh, requires uh, copies of documentation along to support rent or lease payments as well um, makes this a little bit cumbersome, which is uh, why you'll hear uh, Brian, Brandon and I focusing on payroll as the, as the key. Uh, it sounds like a lost bill. I'm going to take point. over for that. Um, so your cat. Sorry. I think we can still hear you, Bill. Um, Brandon, can we hear you? Sure. John, uh, can you hear me? Bill Tom. Yes, we can hear Bill. Brandon, can we hear you? I think you lost can connection you there Brandon? for a minute. We see him. I, I see him. We don't hear him. I'm here. There we go. Okay. Okay. We just lost there connection go, Brandon, for a moment, start and, and okay. we're back. Go ahead. Brandon, you were starting to say? Yeah, so everybody can see the um, cash, non-cash compensation slide okay? So the, yes. um, when we're including wages, we also can add the employer um, contribution that we're making for health insurance and retirement plans for the employees. Now, when it comes to the owners themselves, there are special rules. Um, so you cannot use health insurance and retirement plans. Um, can't use health insurance for self-employed individuals, partners in a partnership, or S-corp owners. Um, the exemption to that is if, you, um, if you're an S-corp shareholder, you can include the company's retirement contributions. Um, you also include, including wages, the uh, employer portion of state taxes that are assessed on payroll. So that would include our state unemployment um, and other local taxes, but does not include Social Security and Medicare taxes. And just want to point out on the right here, we'll see 
um, the caps on non-owner versus owner compensation. So if you're going to elect an eight-week period, you're allowed 850 seconds of your 2019 compensation. Um, if you're going to elect a 24-week period, you can have up to 24 weeks of covered payroll. And on top of that, you can add your health insurance and retirement plan contributions versus the owner's payroll costs. For an eight week period, it's limited to 850 seconds. And for 24 weeks, they capped it now at two and a half months, which was what your original loan was based on. Um, but they did this because they did not want the owners to get the funds, lay everybody off, and then use all the funds for themselves. Uh, business mortgage interest payments. Um, these are going to be, you can make these for, this could be qualified expenses for any real or personal property. Um, where the loan was set before February 15th. Um, you cannot prepay any loan and use PPP money and you, this will not include the principal portion, it's only for interest. Your business rents and leases, you know, this can be on buildings, vehicles, but it would have to be a signed lease agreement um, before February 15th of this year. And one question that has come up a lot is whether or not a related party rent between an operating business and a rental of business um, is allowed, and that is allowed. You can pay yourself rent, but you're gonna to need to have an agreement in place before February 15th. Uh, business utility payments, um, you know, that's your typical gas, electricity, cable, internet, and in addition to that, um, transportation, which would be if you're paying salespeople um, standard mileage rate, that would also count towards your utility payments. One other key term to point out is full-time equivalent employees. So this is important to know because we're gonna need this in order to calculate your loan forgiveness and whether or not there's any reduction based on your employee count. So there's two ways to calculate it. There's a simplified method where if you're working 40 or more hours a week, you're gonna have 1.0. You can't go above 1.0. So you're either gonna be 1.0 and if you're below 40 hours a week, um, it would be 0.5. The other way to calculate it is to take your actual hours. If you're working 30 hours a week, 30 divided by 40 would give you 0.75 for this full-time equivalent count. Um, in the event you, are gonna to have to calculate your full-time equivalent employees for any potential loan reduction, loan forgiveness reduction. One thing to keep in mind, you're gonna to wanna to elect the simplified method if you have a lot of employees that are working part-time under 20 hours a week. If the majority of your workforce is working 15 to 20 hours a week, the simplified method's gonna be better for you because you're gonna get 0.5 for everyone um, that's below the 40 hour cap, so. And Bill, uh, you want to walk us through who's who's going to be qualified to file the 3508EZ or the long form? Sure. Uh, presentation uh, that, that we have here, there's really two, two directions. If you're a self-employed, sole proprietor, independent contractor, uh, you're going you're to have the option of going the long form, I'm short form. Uh, on the other side of the equation, uh, it, back to Brandon's uh, point about uh, reducing wages and so on, if you did not reduce the wages more than 25%, uh, and then you did not either A, have the, uh, the uh, wages returned by the end of the covered period, or um, able to operate at the same level of activity as before 215, then you, you can make your way through the easy form. Um, at present, the way we've looked at our um, profile of our customers, we are actually projecting that over 75% of our, our uh, applicants, uh, at participants are going to be using the easy form in this scenario. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Do you want anything to, Brent, please? Yeah, I think one thing just to point out, so for number one, you know, if you're a Schedule C or a Schedule F um, filer, self-employed, no employees, you didn't use any wages, you just use your 2019 self-employment earnings, you're going to 100% qualify for the easy streamlined application and you will be granted 100% forgiveness because you're allowed to have two and a half months of your 2019 payroll, which was based, that's how your loan was first calculated. Um, so if you're self-employed, no employees, 
you're going to get 100 percent forgiveness and you're going to be able to use the easy form which i think a lot of the borrowers were um and one other point for number two here when we're talking about didn't reduce wages by more than 25 percent and did not reduce the average paid hours there are two reductions that you can ignore one of them is the inability to rehire your february 15th employees due to the inability to find a similar skilled person also if you offer to restore employees hours but they refused because maybe they were collecting unemployment and they were better off or they themselves were impacted by covid those reductions are not going to count for this so you still will be able to uh, make the certification you're allowed to use the easy form so great thanks bill and you bill you want to touch on the safe harbors here now this is going to be for uh, people who are going to use the long form who don't qualify for the 3508EZ, but there's still going to be some safe harbors that we can elect, and Bill can discuss a few of those here. Okay. Uh, so, number one, if the business activity is reduced between February 15th and the end of your period, uh, you, you won't have a reduction in your forgiveness amounts. Uh, we're going to get you to monitor that one. Uh, number two, uh, you'll be exempt from the reduction for, of, in loan forgiveness if you reduce the uh, FTE level between 215 and 426, as Brenda, Brenda was mentioning, that you were shut down, et cetera, and then restore them before 1231. Uh, the wage reduction safe harbor, uh, you could reduce the annual wages during the covered period by 20, 25%. But again, um, it has to be uh, compared to the same period uh, be preceding the um, shutdown period between January of 2020 and March 31st of 2020. And if you, uh, uh, this is the one where Brandon, I, I, a little help here, but if you have more than 25% harbor, I'll be met if you're back by 1231. So uh, it's back to that same issue uh, Brandon was mentioning about getting your your uh, salary levels back to the uh, pre-COVID period by December 31st of this year. Yeah, so as most of us you know, small business owners that were shut down or partially shut down, you know, there's no way we're not going to have a wage reduction or a full-time equivalent reduction most likely. So. As long mm -hmm. as we restore those by the earlier of the date you apply for forgiveness or the end of the year, that's going to let you meet the safe harbor. You will not have reduced loan forgiveness, but you will have to fill out the long form and elect this. So something to keep in mind as we go forward, but you will be able to still obtain full loan forgiveness, even with a reduction in your full-time equipment account during the covered period or if you reduced wages above 25% during the covered period. So, okay, great. So I'm gonna switch over to um, a few examples here. Let's see. So we're first gonna run through the 3508 EZ application. And so this example is gonna be for one owner with two employees that did not have a change to their pay or hours work. So a really simplified example, but it does apply to some of our local businesses here that um, didn't have a big change. They used the funds as they were intended and they're now they're looking for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So here is, you know, don't want to get too caught up on the math here, but just to kind of give a layout in the middle of the screen here, you're going to see how the original loan amount was calculated and which was the 2019 payroll of $200,000. You would have divided that by 12, and then you're allowed two and a half months of that. So this company would have received about 42,000 in loan proceeds. Above, you'll see the wages. So we have one owner and two employees. Uh, the owner makes 100,000, each employee makes 50,000. So during the covered period, the payroll costs that they're gonna be eligible to use, assuming they kept paying that same 2019 salary, the owner is going to be allowed two and a half months. Um, so that's going to be 20,833, which is the cap for any owner based on a 24 week pay period. The employees are allowed to go for the full 24 weeks. So if you paid your employees for 24 weeks, you can count 24 weeks of 
payroll costs towards this forgiveness calculation. So you're gonna see both the employees have 24 out of 52 weeks by their $50,000 wage. So total payroll costs, total 66,987. Down on the bottom, just a quick summary of the rent and utility payments. We're gonna ignore any interest just for a simplified example here. But so we're gonna have 12,000 in rent, 3,000 in utilities. We're gonna ignore health insurance and retirement plans, as I mentioned, just to keep this a simplified example. I'm gonna switch over to the actual application itself. So here is the 3508EZ, the most current version. Um, we'll run through how this is all laid out. So up top is the company information. So your company name, where it is, your EIN or social security number if you're self-employed, primary contact name, email, phone number. So that's all would be included up top here. As we work down, the SBA and your lender is gonna to wanna to know the loan number, the lender's loan number, how much you've received in PPP funds, when you received it, and the number of employees that you had at the date you applied, and then the date that you're going for forgiveness. And this goes back to this full-time equivalent calculation. We're also gonna to have to disclose that EIDL. So economic injury disaster loan, that was that advance that was up to $10,000, $1,000 per employee. So for this company, they would have had a $3,000 advance. We're gonna to have to disclose that, disclose our application number of that advance and keep that on the form, which will then reduce forgiveness. In the middle here, you'll see the payroll schedule is where you're gonna select whether you're weekly, bi-weekly, or other, and what your covered period is. You know, back to what we were discussing in the key terms, the covered period is May 1st, which was the date they received the funds, and then we're gonna count out 24 weeks. As we mentioned, we're gonna elect the alternative payroll covered period because now it's gonna align with our payroll records. Now we can produce 24 weeks of payroll reports that are gonna be able to be given to your lender for easy forgiveness. Um, I'm gonna assume 95% or more of people are gonna elect this alternative payroll cover period, um, unless you're self-employed. Um, as we're gonna see here, so line one, payroll costs, we're gonna include that, and that was the amount that we calculated for the 2020 wages paid during the covered period. So we're gonna have our payroll costs. If you had mortgage interest, you would include that here on line two. Line three is gonna include all your business rents and lease payments. And line four is gonna be the utility payments. So line five summarizes all of your qualified expenses that we're gonna be able to use towards forgiveness. Move down a little bit here. So line six is where we're gonna put how much we actually received on our loan amount. So that's gonna be the 41,667, which um, would come from what was deposited into your bank account. And line seven is a test. And that goes back to the minimum of 60% payroll requirement. So we actually take line one, the 66,987, and we divide it by 0.6 to say, have we spent at least 60% on payroll? Um, and this will then, when we look at line eight, you're gonna take the lesser of five, six, and seven. So in our example, we have more eligible costs than our loan amount. So we're gonna use line six. We're gonna be 100% forgiven on this application minus that $3,000 EIDL loan. So when you go for your application, you're either gonna have the option to repay the $3,000 or term it out over the two or five years. And Sorry. Bill, did you wanna add anything to the EZ application at this time? No, um, that's exactly the, the, the key point about the EIDL advance. Uh, that money came in fast and furious uh, early in the process with the um, uh, start of the uh, COVID uh, shutdown. Um, and just get, can't forget about it. It is separate from the EIDL loans, which are our term loans directly with the SBA. Great. So let's take a look. 
So that was the 3508EZ. So now we'll move over to the 3508, the long form. Um, and one other thing I just, I meant to point out, um, and I'm not sure what Bank ESB is doing, but I, from what I understand, a lot of the banks will be to have an online platform where you will actually log in, work through these applications, upload all of your payroll information and submit this form electronically to your bank. So um, it'd be, it's good to take a look at the form and understand what's happening, but I think a lot of the banks will have a platform to apply for forgiveness. That second bullet point there, pppforgivenesstool.com, that was uh, developed by the AICPA, which is the National CPA Society and um, Business to Credit. So they developed this tool. I've worked through it a few times with some clients. It's fantastic. Um, so if you wanted to get in there, kind of run your scenario, it's a great way to see where your forgiveness is heading and also some things to think about during this 24 week period. Okay, so back to the uh, forgiveness application. So we're gonna work through the 3508 long form. So we're gonna assume one owner, same thing, two employees, but now one of the employees hours and pay are cut by 50%. We're also gonna assume there are no safe harbors that are gonna be met. Um, big picture, this is gonna be a pretty rare situation given how much COVID has impacted our local economy, local small businesses, but we wanted to use the reduction to illustrate how these forms are gonna work. So let's switch over to Brandon? Yes. I know you're answering questions later, but I see it says, does utility include telephone? I would assume. Yes, it does. Yes, okay. and thank, thank you for asking. Yes, utility um, does include telephone expense, whether it's cell phone, landline, and if, if it's wrapped up in a package with cable and internet, it will all be included in utility. Okay, and it says, why divided by 0.60 versus multiplied by 0.60 for payroll? Great question. Let me go back to um, the application here. So payroll costs says, and this is the easy application that we're looking at here, payroll costs requirement is 60%. So they wanna take how much you actually spent on payroll and divide that by 60% to gross it up to say, did you spend at least 60% on payroll? And that's, and when we're looking at line eight, it's the lesser of five, six and seven. So for example, if this client only spent 20,000 on payroll here in the total payroll costs versus 66,987, you would divide the 20,000 by 0.6 and get 33,000. So when we come down here into line seven, line seven would be 33,000, you have to take a lesser of the three. So if this company did not spend as much as it did on payroll, it would have had limited forgiveness. So it's, it's just a way to test the minimum threshold of 60% of payroll. And then we take the lesser of boxes five, six, and seven on line eight, which is your actual forgiveness. And 95% of um, people are gonna have, it be line six is gonna be the lowest amount in here. So. Thank you. You're welcome. So back to the long form 3508. Very similar to our previous example. Same wages, same loan amount, um, you know, same rent, same utilities. But the big change was that Luke here, a non-owner employee, we reduced his hours and wages by 50%. He was making 50,000 working full time. We were cut his hours, we cut his wages. So because of that, we're gonna have to look at the full time equivalent. Now that was, that's important to know as we work through the long form. You don't include owners when we're looking at full-time equivalent counts. So if you have multiple owners in a partnership corporation, um, those owners will be backed out and not part of the full-time equivalent reduction calculation. Here we'll see what our full-time equivalent was as of February 15th, which is, that's where you use it to test the safe harbor. 
So since they both were full time, they both would have a 1.0. Now we reduce Luke's in half. So 0.5 for Luke, one for Ken. Now we went from two full time equivalent employees to one and a half by the end of our covered period. So let's look at the actual long form. And once again, this is a simplified example. We're not going to include retirement benefits, health insurance, state taxes. That's going to give you even more qualified expenses for forgiveness. Um, so here, just back up. Here we have the form 3508, mm -hmm. long form. Okay. So as we scroll down here, this form has schedules attached to it. So we're actually gonna start in the back. Um, there is a schedule A and then there's a worksheet to schedule A. Let me work my way down here. So this is the Schedule A worksheet. This is where we're going to list employees that make under $100,000 and are non-owners. So here we have Ken and Luke. You'd have the last four of their social. What was paid to them during the covered period? So Ken was the one, was the employee that was not reduced. So there's his $23,000 in cash compensation. Luke was reduced in half. So that's gonna be half of what they were making before. We have to disclose the full-time equivalent um, during the covered period. So for Ken, it was, it's gonna be 1.0 and for Luke, it'll be 0.5 because he was reduced in half from when we received the PPP funds. The salary and hourly wage reduction, Bill mentioned that you're allowed to have up to a 25% reduction. Anything above 25% it's gonna reduce your potential loan forgiveness. So Luke's wages were cut in half, 25% of that will be ignored. The other 25% is here, 5,769. Now, if you have more than you know, seven or eight employees, you're gonna do this in Excel and give this to the bank in an Excel sheet if you have say 50 employees. So that is schedule A, table one. We'll scroll down to table two. This is where non-owner employees who make more than $100,000 would go. We don't have any in this example, but that's where they would go. No employer wages should be included here on the Schedule A worksheet. So from after we've summarized our employee payroll, we can then go to Schedule A. And bear with me as this loads. So here we have the PPP Schedule A. Line one is where we enter the cash compensation that we've just calculated on the uh, worksheet. We enter the full-time equivalent employees that we have and any salary wage reduction. We've just calculated that on the other form. This in the middle here, table two, that's, this is where anybody making over 100,000 would go. And then non-cash, as we mentioned before, you are allowed to use employee health insurance, employee retirement contributions, and state taxes. Those would all be added here to give you even more potential uh, expenses for loan forgiveness. Line nine is where, now we're gonna add the owner's compensation here. So the owner, just to reiterate, owner's compensation will not go on the worksheet. It will be put here on line nine. And then we sum up the total payroll costs. And then we can go to the first page of the application just to show you how this will all lay out. Very similar to the EZ format. It's just we have a few other lines that will account for any potential reduction.
Bear with me one second. Claudia, do you have that, um, the 3508 form available to pull up? I hear you. Let's see. Okay. Which one? Um, uh, 3508 um, PDF. I'm just looking for page one. I'm not sure why this. Is it Smith Company? Yes. Okay. So I can do screen. I think you're going to have to stop screen sharing and then I will. Okay. Oh, it says I can actually you can do it. But <laughs> so There we go. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so the, the top's the same, you know, all the business information, same middle section as well, where we're showing the SBA loan number, we're showing the employees. Now you'll see the change where we're looking at employees at time of application was two, employees at time of forgiveness is now one and a half. So we reduced our full-time equivalent employees. Same thing, we're gonna have the EIDL advance disclosed here. We're gonna choose the same, uh, alternative covered period. And if you can scroll down a little bit, Claudia, we can look at how this actually is calculated. Perfect. Thank you. So line one is going to be the payroll cost that came from Schedule A, um, 55000 Line three will show your business rents. Line four, the utility payments. So line five is new for the 3508. That's where we're going to show any dollar amount for the salary and hourly wage reduction. Um, so this was calculated based on any wages or salary that was reduced more than 25% during the covered period. And we calculated that to be 5,769 uh, because of the 50% reduction. So now we're gonna sum up lines one, three, four, and five to come up with what we have for potential expenses to be forgiven against our loan which is 64,679. This FTE reduction quotient, so that's where now we have to account for what happened with our full-time equivalent employees. If you did not have a reduction, line seven would be 1.0. We did have a reduction. We went from two employees uh, to one and a half based on this full-time equivalent um, calculation. So that's a 25% reduction in our full-time equivalent employees, which means we're only gonna be eligible for three quarters or 75% of expenses that we incurred during that 24 week period. So that's why line eight is gonna take line six, which is our total qualified expenses. We're gonna multiply that by this full-time equivalent reduction percentage which is 75%. So we had to reduce it by 25%, we're allowed 75%. So that's where we come up with line eight. So line eight is gonna be your modified total eligible expenses. Line nine, once again, is gonna show the loan amount. How much did we get to begin with? And line 10, once again, we'll have that 60% threshold test. Now we're allowed the lesser of the three. So this was an example that Bill and I wanted to point out to everyone. This particular company had one owner employee, two non-owner employees. One of the non-owner employees was reduced in half, wages and hours. But they're still gonna get full forgiveness here because they incurred 24 weeks of expenses instead of eight. So even though they were reduced by 25% based on line seven, this full-time equivalent quotient, their modified total expenses still exceed their PPP loan amount. So there's a lot of flexibility here where you might have a company that had six employees, two of them were laid off, but because we have 24 weeks of qualified expenses to now include in this calculation, even if there is a reduction even if you as a business owner can't meet these safe harbor requirements, 
there's a really good chance you're still going to get full forgiveness because we've tripled the period of qualified expenses. And I'm going to check with Bill. Bill, do you have anything you want to add on yes. the 508 here? Yeah, yeah, please. That was a great explanation. Um, and what we're seeing is uh, how you manipulate these numbers into different scenarios. So in other words, if you had 10 employees and went down to three for uh, uh, th this uh, calculation, this quotient would be 0.3, which leaves you with 20 odd thousand dollars uh, of uh, the modified amount on line eight. And that's where you start to see uh, how borrowers could potentially have some remaining balance left here. You, do you agree with that, Brandon? Yes. Yep. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. and, and that so that's why we, you know. Go ahead, Bill. No, no. And that's, that's, that's the, the magic of this process. I, I don't, you know, I think the uh, way they form the um, requirements here and with this FTE test, we'd love to see it gone. But, but as a result of how they wanted to run the stimulus program, how they wanted to test it out, this is, this is one of the main factors in the end. So uh, clearly, uh, modest reductions in uh, FTE probably don't cause uh, big issues, but uh, uh, large reductions uh, do. So. Exactly. And this assumes, like, once again, we're not going to use a safe harbor. Um, I, I can't think of many local businesses with all my clients that weren't drastically impacted by COVID. So that is an election you can make. Instead of line seven being 0.75, it would be 1.0 because I would say I was unable to operate during this covered period because my business was shut mm -hmm. down or because I was at half capacity or restaurants that were allowed to do takeout but not dine in. Like that is a dramatic impact on their business. They can elect a full-time equivalent safe harbor and they're exempt from a reduction. So uh, okay. between all that, I. I'm, I'm, I can't really think of a client of mine that's not going to get 100% forgiveness because they spent the funds. And that's a key to this whole PPP loan program is if you got the money, you need to spend it over that 24 week period. Because if you don't spend it, we have no chance at electing safe harbors and then um, getting you full forgiveness. So um, let me open up my screen share here. Okay. Go back to this presentation. Brandon, a quick question while you're still on the long form. Sure. Um, Moore is asking, do you recommend that business owners fill out the Schedule A worksheet first, like you did here? Yes, so you would start with the Schedule A worksheet and work your way back. Um, so you schedule a worksheet would be first, then you go into the schedule a, and then that would bring ever all the information up to the front of the form. And um, that's going to help you really determine employee by employee who might have had a full time equivalent reduction, who might have had a salary or wage reduction. Um, but yes, you start in the back of this. Um, just because the SBA wanted to confuse us, they want us to start on the last page. So, um, <laughs> So some documentation that you're gonna to wanna to think about and gather as we're going for forgiveness with your lender. And as I mentioned, a lot of banks are gonna have online platforms, so we're going on and get this in PDF form. But it's anything that's really gonna to have to prove out your qualified expenses. So when it comes to payroll, we're gonna need payroll reports for those periods. And by electing the alternative covered period, your payroll report will line right up with that 24 week period. Um, whether you use a local service provider or a national one, um, they're all going to work and have automatically generated reports for this PPP program. So check with your payroll provider. Um, when it comes to rent, utilities, uh, business interest, the banks might need things like lease agreements, um, canceled checks, proof of payment, bank statements, things like that. Um, you, you can look and see if you go to the SBA website and check out the 3508 and 3508 EZ instructions. There's a complete list of what you're going to need, but your local bank can also work with you on what documentation you have to provide. Since the 3508 is the long form, um, as you would assume, there's additional information required to submit with the long form versus the easy application. So once again, if you meet the easy qualifications, 
we want you there. You should be filling that form out. It's going to make everybody's life easier. Um, and some information will go to your bank. Some you're required to keep um, in the event that your uh, loan was collected by the SBA for audit. Move on to the next slide. So, oops. so potential legislative changes that can dramatically impact what's going on right now. There is a proposal to make all loans around $150,000 automatically forgiven. Um, so they'll automatically turn into a grant and that will then simplify the process for 75 to 80% of the borrowers. And most of my clients, I think most of our small business community here did receive a loan under 150,000. So that's a proposal. If that passes, that's gonna give a lot of relief to us small business owners. There's also a proposal which, um, I know the AICPA is pushing for that for all the business owners across the country. Currently, if you receive PPP funds, and those, that is forgiven by the SBA and your lender. If you get $100,000, for example, in a PPP loan, if that gets forgiven, that 100,000 is not taxable to you. So that's fantastic. We have non-taxable income, um, so that's great. Currently though, the associated expenses are not deductible either. So if you think about it for an example, let's say the month of May, you were partially closed, you were at 50% of your revenue base, but now you have no overhead because now the PPP loan is paying for your payroll, your rent, your utilities. So in a month where you might've had 50% sales, you almost had zero overhead or very limited overhead. So you can have a very profitable month, for example, by utilizing this PPP money and then actually create taxable income. So currently it's, there's a backdoor way of really making this PPP loan taxable. Um, Congress is working whether or not to make the expenses deductible for tax purposes, which will give you a double benefit. So if you got $100,000, this is then gonna give you about a 30%, depending on your income tax bracket. It's gonna give you an additional $30,000 benefit. So if that passes, that's gonna be great news for the small business community here. Um, and Bill, do you want to touch on the last uh, three bullet points here about the potential about a second sure. round PPP for severe? Sure. Yeah, and uh, again, the, the, the money is still available on PPP through the beginning uh, of August. Uh, we're seeing a, a, really a slow trickle of applications coming in at this stage, but you still see a number of people who have really stayed on the sideline. Uh, here. So again, we're going to just go back again and remind people if you haven't looked at it yet, it's still you still have an option of doing this. Uh, we we see different information uh, from uh, our sources, but direct from the SBA and through the American Bankers Association on items that are being considered. Uh, where there is still money available on PPP, will they come back and uh, refresh that or come up with another round uh, for severely impacted businesses? I think we could all look at certain situations in the area uh, where businesses are just um, uh, uh, restricted into submission, uh, child care, uh, bars, et cetera, uh, that uh, really ha have still had an impact. And the question will come is, do the, uh, does the government look at this and look at any additional stimulus that comes in the form of uh, direct to um, uh, taxpayers, uh, as well as the $600 unemployment benefits that are rolling off? Uh, from our side, uh, we're still seeing some ongoing changes. We're hoping this is going to streamline and improve the application process uh, here. Uh, we're starting to see, as of last uh, Thursday, uh, some procedural notices that are coming out uh, with identifying the portal that they'll be using for us to enter, the banks to enter information in. And the scenario, again, is that uh, working with your payroll company, working with your CPA, you'll form your SBA forgiveness application, uh, the 3508 or the EZ form, uh, submitting that to the bank. And then the bank will have up to 60 days uh, to, to submit that 
to the SBA for forgiveness. And what, what we have, we will either be coming in with, uh, we have three answers to provide. Approving the forgiveness, denying the, the, the forgiveness of which we need to provide the borrower with a written explanation. And then lastly, uh, a denial without prejudice, which in fact turns the decision towards the SBA for, for review. So we have up to 60 days, believe me, uh, when we get them in, uh, we're, we're looking to attack this as quickly as possible uh, and get them out of our office in an organized fashion uh, as, as best we can. We've got, uh, as a corporation, over 1,500 uh, of these that uh, we have to work with. So we're looking to uh, get them off our desk and into the SBA, SBA world for consideration. The last part of this is that the SBA now has 90 days from the date of receipt to provide an provide an answer and remit payment on the eligible claims uh, to, to the banks. Uh, so in this scenario, uh, you're looking at up to uh, five months. Let's assume that the bank can get the, the applications out in half that, half that time, if that's even uh, realistic, but just say it's 30 days, that's 120 days to a maximum of 150 days before you're getting a response on these. And I know we have a lot of customers that are looking at these CPP loans on their balance sheet one, they're anxious to get the forgiveness because that is the brass ring at the end of the stimulus program. And the second part of it is that they want it off their balance sheet at the end of fiscal year. Uh, you know, these, these uh, PPP loans uh, were significant uh, to some borrowers, uh, construction businesses, uh, healthcare, et cetera. And these numbers can dramatically impact leverage ratios, which end up tripping covenants. Uh, with the banks. So I, we have a lot of customers who are concerned about uh, getting these loans forgiven. But uh, if we can set the uh, bar at the right level, uh, the expectation might be that uh, you'd be very lucky to see these, um, the response from the SBA uh, before year end. So we're expecting it uh, in 2021. Do you agree with that, Brandon, in terms of the timelines that we're looking at? Yeah, and you know this can have impact on loan covenants for those clients that have uh, commercial loans with you know uh, debt service and other uh, debt to equity ratios. So the sooner the better. And I, I don't want to speak for you, Bill, but my assumption is you know Bank ESB and every other bank they're going to do their best to help their customers get forgiven because they don't want um, you know it's a one percent loan. So um, I know that if I was a bank, I wouldn't want to be. Uh, administering a 1% loan when I could be making 4 or 5% on that money. So it's in everybody's exactly. to get this forgiven, um, taken care of, and because the banks need the money back. Because correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, but the B Bank ESB actually directly funded these and they're waiting to be repaid by the SBA. Absolutely. So the, the, the funds that were issued to you for your SBA PPP loans were, were bank funds. Uh, in turn, uh, we had consideration on the other side for, for funding uh, value and, and so on, but it was bank funds on, on the outset. And we also signed up for this program or were told to sign up for the program by the federal government but to um, uh, a two-year repayment, six months interest only for the terms of your original PPP loans that were in, in phase one. Uh, six months interest only followed by 18 months of principal and interest on any amounts that weren't forgiven. And much to our surprise, uh, you can imagine our, our, how, how pleased we were to find out that these can be stretched out to five. But the bottom line is, this is a stimulus program. Uh, we're completely on board with uh, uh, supporting our small businesses to the best of our ability. Uh, these are the pro this is the program requirements that uh, the SBA has handed out, and we will follow them. Um, so uh, the, the, the bottom line is, uh, we we're just want to process and prosecute these forgiveness to the best of our ability to get our customers uh, money back. Definitely. And I can speak uh, on behalf of some of my clients, Bill, that uh, Bank ESB did a great job at um, processing these loans, working long days, and making sure all of our local business community got taken care of. So um, thanks to you guys for doing that. Um, one other... I, I, I think... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Bill. No, no, I think, um, you know, in, in, in light, all the, all the banks uh, did, a, did a great job. I know working with uh, CPA firms, I, uh, just with yourself, we're getting good, clean applications in. It actually made our job easy to have our customers working so diligently in, in assembling that information, working with their CPAs to organize it properly. And then the, the unsung hero on the back here, it was the payroll companies. I think we were about a, a quarter of the way through the first round of PPP, 
and uh, we started to see payroll companies producing the reports necessary uh, to, to digest the um, ca the calculations of uh, average uh, average uh, monthly income here, and it made uh, made our lives easy. Uh, in turn, we are looking back to them again to have uh, the the same programs available uh, when the final calculations of, of uh, the uh, SBA forgiveness are, are settled and we're ready to move forward. So we're hoping that, that that's a key element uh, going forward here. Great, and a few last quick points then we'll turn it over to uh, question and answer. Um, so there is a potential that we could have a second round of PPP funding. And this would be for severely impacted companies. We don't have a lot of guidance right now. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to happen. We'll see what happens with Congress. But as business owners, it'd be a good time to make sure you have monthly financial statements available from January 1st of 2019 all the way through June 30th of this year. Because if they're going to do another round of stim, uh, PPP funding, it's going to be for a restaurant, for example, that might have been shut down for uh, three months. But you're going to have to show that the, the April to June period is drastically different than the four preceding quarters, for example. So um, you're going to want to get um, right. monthly financial statements together for the last year and a half, all of your quarterly payroll reports, your tax return ready to go. In the event there's another round, I'm assuming it's going to be limited funding. It's going to go quick. In addition, sure. um, they're talking about doing another round of those $1,200 stimulus checks. Um, that's in Congress right now. Um, and on top of that, they are discussing extending this additional federal benefit. It might not be 600. They're talking about capping it at 70% of your 2019 earnings, but it does sound like they might push through some extended unemployment benefits on top of the mass benefits. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it back to Claudia and then we can kind of go through a, answer any questions. Yep. If you, yeah, excuse me, Brandon, one, one item is uh, as you're talking about PPP, um, subsequent rounds if they in fact make their make its way through Congress. Uh, just remember you have another option here. Uh, the way we've looked at the PPP is, sh is short-term working capital. It funded your, your labor costs, uh, supported your labor costs, kept your employees engaged. Uh, the other program, the economic injury disaster loans are also still available. I think while those loans do not carry a forgiveness uh, option, they do provide long-term working capital, long-term impact to your business. Uh, these loans can be amortized up to 30 years at 3.75%. You access them directly with the SBA and, um, they're, and they're repaid directly to the SBA. So it's not something you work through, through the bank on, but the, uh, yeah, the, the, the thoughtful um, uh, support of your your business, you know, can be in two, two worlds. Think of it as the PPP being short term and the EIDL being being the long term as well. Thank Great. you, Bill. That's awesome. That's amazing. Um, both of you have offered amazing points, um, perspective for moving forward, but also looking back and how we now um, work through these forms. I have a quick question. Are these forms now available at our local banks? forms that you shared today? The forms are available on the SBA's website. Website? Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. So can um, can you give me that link or, or uh, can I type that link, everyone? What's that? Do you know it, it's on the... Okay. So, um, and the is it suggested that people, people go back to where they originally took out their PPP when they, or this goes directly to SBA when they do this online? The form. I'm sorry, Claudia. I had difficulty hearing you. It was breaking up. The forgiveness. Uh, you the, e idea? the forgiveness forms that Brandon presented. If you go on the website and you complete those, do you complete them and submit them directly to SBA or through your bank? No, no. They're going to go to the bank. And okay. from our perspective, with our clients, and I can't speak for all the banks, uh, because the restrictions and program requirements have been changing and we're still looking at some changes along the way here we've encouraged our clients to hold off preparing those forms obviously if you want to prepare them pro forma to see how this is going to to work out how you think you're going to manage uh, in terms of uh, the full forgiveness on your debt whether you meet the safe harbors test as brandon was talking about that to do that work on your own now is is great 
uh, gives you an idea of where you're heading. But from our bank, we're, we're holding off accepting those applications until this really settles out. And yeah, you know, we were looking for this information back in April, May, June, and here we are at the end of July. And I think we're very close to the end in terms okay. of being able to accept those and begin processing. Okay, so we have some questions from our participants. Um, one of the questions is, um, are the PP funds considered income, especially if we use it all for payroll? Sure, I can take that one, Bill. The, uh, the PPP loan, if it is forgiven, is not taxable income to the company. Um, as we mentioned, the expenses related to that are not deductible. So kind of a back way of saying, unless Congress changes anything, um, you, as I mentioned, you could have a month where you have taxable income in a very low sales month because your payroll, your rent, your utilities are no longer tax deductible. But the direct answer is no, your loan, your forgiven loan proceeds are not taxable income. And if you have loan proceeds that are not forgiven and termed out for two or five years, those are also not considered income. So, so someone else asked, uh, what about owners that didn't have a payroll because their workers are private contractors? Those, those expenses are not qualified for forgiveness. And there was a lot of confusion with what was eligible expenses back when you applied for the loan initially. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I neglected to mention to everybody was you're gonna to wanna to make sure, because as you fill out these uh, forgiveness applications, you also need to attest that the loan amount was correct. So if you knowingly have funds that you should not have received, and that's an example of one where if you got an, um, PPP loan based on subcontractors that were not paid payroll, but were paid 1099 miscellaneous, mm -hmm. you're going to want to, you should be refunding those proceeds back to your bank. And Bill, do you want to hop in there? Is that correct from your perspective too? Yes, yes. Uh, we, we even went through the process of uh, borrowers that felt that uh, they didn't need the PPP funding um, and uh, felt that they would, you know, get some undue criticism from the government. Uh, as it related to taking PPP funds when uh, they didn't need them. But you're, you're exactly right. right? That, sure. that would be the, your, your best uh, angle. Don't look at this as a 1% loan over two or five years um, and in returning it would be uh, warranted. But uh, yeah, yeah, I think you're on the right track. Yeah, and, and Claudia, for, this, for that um, question, the, so if, you have a, if you're self-employed but no employees, your loan amount is limited to two and a half months, so two and a half months of your 2019 Schedule C net income, net profit. So mm -hmm. any subcontractor right. are not eligible. Okay, okay. And that was uh, the hard part in the early stages of the, uh, the, the program was these provisions were changing rather quickly, sometimes in the middle of the day. <laughs> and uh, so the process that was in, uh, used at the beginning of the PPP process, beginning of April, uh, was much different than where we were by the by the end of April uh, in terms of calculations and and so on. Things became fine tuned. So it's it's not um, you know I think there was uh, provisions in there that the, they indicated that if the, you filled it out to the best of your ability at the time, it does not create any kind, kind of a fraud situation. But uh, um, you know we were all working with imperfect information. This was uh, as the SBA described it this was building the airplane after you're already flying it so uh we're, we're all working to the best of our ability mm. um okay another question is what if you spent the funds over a 12-week period but are unsure unsure if you can maintain full-time for the full 24 weeks full-time employment so if you have spent the funds and then from the 12 weeks on or are concerned about how you're going to maintain, especially if you have a, 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 an additional shutdown or resurgence. Um, that's when you're going to most likely be able to elect one of the safe harbors. Uh, unfortunately, you probably have to fill out the long form, but you'll still be able to receive full forgiveness as long as you spent what they gave you, mm -hmm. meaning 60% of payroll, 40% can be for rent, utilities, um, and interest. But if at the end of your 24 weeks, you can't operate as you did before February 15th because of COVID, 
which as I mentioned, are gonna, is gonna be most companies, you can elect a safe harbor and you still will receive full forgiveness. And, um, right. That's helpful, thank you. Let me just see, I'm gonna scroll right. down and see. Um, what documentation will you be expected to produce if you do not use a payroll company? It's this has come up a lot. I know we've had it. We've had people yeah. having things written down on paper and napkins. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, some people still process payroll manually. Um, we're not in the payroll business, but I can recommend you go to an outsource provider. It's well worth the time and money. Um, but if you don't use one, let's say you use QuickBooks, you'll use your QuickBooks reports that show the wages paid. I know our example was about February 3rd to October 18th, I believe. So you'll run a report showing wages by employee for the whole period. Um, and on top of that, you might include, you're gonna have your 941s with whether or not you use an outsource provider, you're still gonna have quarterly payroll reports. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's gonna be very similar. It's probably a little bit more of a headache to gather. Um, mm -hmm. uh, okay, so you're saying quarterly Brandon, payroll. Just one of the, I'm sorry, Claudia, bear with me. And Brandon, one of the other key aspects of that is, uh, owner's compensation. While that may have been factored into your PPP loan, we know that owners, especially in these circumstances, have delayed accepting their, their compensation. Uh, do, Brandon, do you advise that uh, to make sure that the funds are properly used, uh, take, the, take the payroll uh, into the owner's control, pay it to the owner, and then in fact lend it, lend it back to the company just to get the money back in the company where it, it perhaps is needed? That's a great point, Bill. If, if you have a low number of employees and your uh, S Corp or corporate owner taking wages previous to COVID, yes, you should make sure you get over that wage threshold. And if you do have to run payroll, you should pay yourself at least that um, 10, what your loan was based on for you. So uh, 10, 50 mm -hmm. seconds, two and a half months of 2019 payroll, you should at least pay that over the 24 week period. But you don't have to. If you if you maybe you add an employee or two um, and you don't want to pay yourself right now, that's okay. But yeah, Bill, I would defer to you should be taking owner's pay to then get full forgiveness. Yeah, this is one of those cases where it pays to talk to your CPA again. Uh, and in our review of some of these applications, we were seeing some you know small companies, uh, five employees or less, where that owner's compensation. Uh, component of the PPP was 50% or greater. So it was a big part of the company's support. And um, you know, it, it had uh, employee, I'm sorry, customers looking for ways to get that money back, you know, into the business and loaning it back was one of the ways uh, that, that you can do that and, and turn it into general use as opposed to uh, keeping it dedicated for payroll use. So, great, thank you, Brandon. So I have a question from the same person who talked about um, paying general contractors. Um, what if at the time of the application, you did mention you had no employees, but needed help only for overhead expenses due to the shutdown? The, but the, the loan amount should have been based on uh, two, two and a half months of the net income from the Schedule C filer. So mm -hmm. if that's what your loan was based on, you're okay. But if for some reason your lender took your net profit from Schedule C, two and a half months of that, two and a half twelfths, and if they added subcontractor 1099 payments, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely a mistake on the point of the, because the borrower is the one that it has to fill out these applications right. Um, I mean, the lenders are obviously right. reviewing them, but the, the mm -hmm. they're doing their due diligence. But yeah, so if they receive funds in excess of two and a half, 12th of their 2019 schedule see that those should be returned and they'll, they'll be eligible for forgiveness based only on what they should have received, which is two and a half 12th. And they should go back to their bank and discuss that with their lender. That's kind of a unique situation. Yeah, yeah it is. I, I agree with you, Brandon. Exactly. Uh, as those applications were coming in and, um, you know, the early stage instructions were pretty, pretty murky. Um, but understand that the bank was accepting some of that information uh, from the, the, the employer as uh, gospel. 
uh, as their facts. And uh, there always is a uh, area of confusion as it relates to 1099 versus uh, true employees. And so there, that, that, that could be present in your situation and just you know, come back, share with the bank, we'll, we'll work through the uh, process. Thank you. Um, I think I wanna go back, someone talked about, um, I think about what's tax deductible, what about your employer matching contributions that we paid to FICA, medical, et cetera. I think you mentioned that earlier. Yeah, so um, the employer or the employee portion, those, when you're talking about FICA, those don't count at all. So Social Security, mm -hmm. Medicare tax is out, right. uh, but state unemployment, um, you're eligible for that. Any other state and local taxes assessed on wages, those will count whether or not it's an owner or an employee. Now for health insurance, Health insurance will work for all of your non-owner employees. And this is the employer portion though. Mm -hmm. So whatever you were paying, if you were doing 75%, 25%. So if the employer was paying 75% before COVID, um, you can take 75% of the employer portion for the health insurance. Um, same thing with retirement contributions for employees. Um, those will count as well. The employer match that you can take that as additional uh, wage expense. There's special rules for owner employees. If you're a partner um, in a partnership or LLC, if you are an S corporation owner, um, or if you're self-employed, health insurance is out. You can't use it at all. If you're a C corporation, you can use your health insurance and your retirement contributions. Um, and then S corporation is a caveat for retirement contributions. You can use retirement contributions if you're an S corporation owner, but not if you're self-employed, sole proprietor, or a partner in a partnership. So let me know, Claudia, if that answers the question there. <laughs> I don't see it to everyone. Um, I'm looking to see if I've answered everyone's. Are there other questions? I found one of the links to the forms. Um, just want to make sure we've answered all. I think we've answered all the questions. Yeah, and if people want to unmute in a orderly fashion, we can uh, you know, go live with questions if we have any. Yes, and I just want to apologize to everyone. We did the, the header of our uh, today's program said 10 to 1130 and it was really nine, which was all in the text. But when I edited it, it still showed the original um, I'm telling you that it was edited. So I apologize for that confusion for Zoom. I couldn't really change Zoom's functionality. Prakash, do you have a question? And, and just an additional comment. Uh, Brandon did a fantastic job on his PowerPoint getting you through the fine details uh, that are here. Uh, I think for the most part, uh, what he presented today might qualify for uh, continuing education if you're a, a CPA listening. It was, a, it was a very, very well done into the, the point. The key is, is that these are technical items, uh, making sure that you're fig filling out your SBA, um, figure this application correctly involves getting good payroll information from your payroll company or your, or your QuickBooks uh, uh, program but uh, working with your CPA closely to make sure this is right. We, we all want your, your, your SBA PPP loan forgiven uh, and uh, get, getting it right the first time is, is uh, gonna make it happen that much quicker, so. Yeah, it looks like we had somebody raise their hand. Um, where is that? If, if, I think somebody just raised their hand if they wanna go ahead and unmute and if they have a question, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, all right. Uh, all I see, I don't know if you can see me, but um, all right, this is Richard Adams, uh, Adams Electric, and Prakash is uh, my bookkeeper. And for some reason, I don't see myself up there, so uh, I'm just going to wing this. Uh, my, my main question about this was PPP meant to basically take uh, my men off of unemployment insurance and kick us and give us a, a good start to get back up and rolling to maintain. And so there were like three or four weeks where I was technically paying them the minimum amounts required, of course, to take care of them, but we weren't necessarily seeing income. And so the money that I paid to match normal like social security 
uh, my, my portion of the med, all that stuff. Was that considered actually uh, part of the, the, the PPP funds or did I have to magically pull this money out of my hat to pay for that? That's a great question. And so the, if you're talking about the employee portion, you know, that's being reduced from their wages, but of if course, talking, yeah, automatically. If you're about the employer portion. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, they, you, they're not allowed forgiveness on the employer match for social security and Medicare. I'm not sure why that happened, but that's the law as is. Um, so yeah, the additional federal level payroll taxes were not allowed. But state, state so as well. State is allowed. So your um, state unemployment insurance, state unemployment taxes, um, you know, paid family leave, and things like that. Those will be allowed in this calculation. But um, now, does your company have uh, you have a physical location, rent, and utilities? Because that should make up the, the yeah. difference. You know, so you should have plenty of expenses. Well, I'm I'm owner operated at my 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 house. You know, so uh, we have a shop in the back, and whatnot. So uh, that's kind of like ten percent on a loan. You know, whatever mortgage we figured that out. But it just seems to me that, especially me, I think we're okay because we're electricians and we definitely started working and making money. But yeah. what about people out there that just took this on and didn't see a lot of income? Where do they get the money to pay for? The, the matching FICA, Social Security, and all that. I just, that's something that didn't make sense to me. I agree. And I think it was, a, it was an oversight in, in, uh, from the SBA and re reality of what was really going on from a cash flow perspective. But um, unfortunately, that's, that's the way it is. All right. Thank you. Question, will the uh, video be available of the uh, presentation? Those of us who might have um, read, used the um, subject of the email as the time for the meeting. Yes, it is absolutely recorded and we have all the forms, uh, links to the forms and also uh, the presentation itself. So we, we can send you everything. Great. We're sending it to everyone who is registered or online today at any time. Whoever jumped on at what time, and again, apologies for that. Um, I don't know why Zoom did that. If I change the time, <laughs> change the time, but that was very confusing. Does anybody else have any uh, general or specific questions for the forgiveness or the PPP program in general? All right. I do see that people, some people are signing off and they said that um, they're really grateful. They thought that was really informative and thorough. So thank you both. Um, this has been incredible. If uh, people think of some questions beyond this and you send them to me, Brandon, can I send them your way? <laughs> oh, definitely happy to help. And I know um, Bill, Bill and I are happy to review any questions that come through and okay. give you what we know now. And like we mentioned, it's still evolving. We, you still can't, the banks can't apply for forgiveness yet anyway through the SBA. Right. We're still waiting on a final FAQ and final quote unquote regs. They keep right. calling them interim final regs, but we're waiting for the, hopefully what will be the final um, rules, but we're happy to help in any way that we can. I think it's just really, Absolutely. we wanted to host this so that our folks could at least prepare. Um, and as you said, what, what documentation do they need? They can at least start gathering. That is half the battle. Um, but also, you know, in preparation, I know we were, we were hoping that that final word would have been out by now, but it hasn't been. So we will come back to everyone. We will let you know, our, our members, the, the minute we know that these forms uh, and banks are ready to take them. And, uh, you know, and if there's more news at that time as well, and if there's any updates, as Brandon mentioned and alluded to, that both Bill and, and Brandon said there's, there could be some changes ahead. So we are prepared to come back if need be. So um, this is really yeah, informative. Yeah, and I, I just want to re I want to emphasize one last thing. It's just uh, business owner, self-employed individual, um, just spend the money. Um, it, if you don't spend the money, you have 0% chance of getting forgiven. Um, so, you know, spend the funds on what it was intended for. Um, you know, some companies are 
maybe looking at this as a short-term loan for cash flow, but you know, I think it's, but you're better off generally speaking to use these funds for payroll, rent, utilities, get it forgiven. And then you know, if you need additional cash flow, look at the EIDL loan or work with your local bank. Um, but I did hear time. that from a lot of our owners in the beginning saying, I did get it. I applied for it. Now I don't know if I want to use it. You know, and that was, you know, especially early on. Um, but you're saying with a lot of this, you know, extended, extended forgiveness that um, the recommendation is to spend it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Brandon's uh, suggestion, exactly the case. I, I think very early on, companies were afraid of using the money because they weren't sure how this was going to play out. As we've gone forward, uh, not only has um, the uh, state's phasing of uh, operations uh, become a little more clear, uh, but also the program has become a little more clear. And I think the landmark uh, item was uh, stretching it out to the uh, 24 weeks, which allows people a uh, clearer path to uh, making use of that money. And uh, I think we saw some people get off the sidelines and get the money into their companies at that point. Okay, great. Well, this has really been helpful. I thank you all. And again, to everyone and those who even uh, attended late, everything will be coming out to you. Huge thank you to Brandon and Bill for this amazing presentation. To John Page, my, my anchor, membership and marketing manager who saved the day with technology <laughs> to make today happen and, um, and every day happen. Thank you, John. And uh, thank you to Pearson Wallace, our sponsor for bringing this series. So, and if anyone wants access to the series in the past, we have recorded all of them. So if you're looking for them, please ask and we will absolutely send them to you. All right. Have a great day, Thanks. everyone. Make it a good one. Thank you, Thank Claudia. You. Thanks everyone for coming on. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you everyone. You're welcome.